And we are wrapping up this series. Uh, this is really a series on the basics of forgiveness. And so I've made that hopefully clear along the way. That, uh, and we'll mention it in this message again. But these are the basic principles. We covered the, uh, I think, most of the basic foundational facts, the, the primary principles of what forgiveness is and what it's based upon. And uh, then our job is to apply that in our understanding and apply it in life as we interact with one another. But we want to look at this text, Luke 17, particularly verses 3 through 10 this morning, under this title of uh, Forgiveness is Just the Beginning. And we'll develop that as we, as we work through, our, through the sermon this morning. I would imagine all of us have encountered along the way, as we travel on the roads and so on, warning signs, traffic signals and such, uh, that alert us to uh, road hazards or danger ahead, that kind of thing. You know, it might be a sign that says bridge out ahead. That, that would be one that you probably want to keep an eye on. Uh, you know, slippery when wet or, you know, bridge freezes before road surface, that kind of stuff. Um, the one I'm kind of using today probably the most is as you're traveling along a highway. could be a two-lane. It could be a, a four-lane interstate. And uh, the simplest version is just that yellow sign with a little bit of a bend, you know, a little bit of a curve, and it means, hey, there's a curve coming up ahead, all right? And, um, you know, some of them, as it gets a little more serious, you know, you might be on the interstate doing 65 if you're keeping the speed limit, and the sign says curve ahead, and it'll give you a suggested, hey, this is a 55 mile an hour curve. You know, you don't, it, uh, interstates, you try not to have too many, but there are places where that happens. And if it's a little more serious, you know, 65 mile an hour speed limit, but it says curve ahead and it's 45 mile an hour suggested. Well, we're getting, it must be a little sharper curve. In fact, there are, there are a few that I have come across. You probably know some that I don't. I'm sure you do. But there are actually places uh, where even on the interstates, there are really sharp curves. There's one in Cleveland. If you've been out I-90, you, you're shaking us right in downtown. I believe it's called Dead Man's Curve. I think some people died there back in the 70s, but it is on Interstate 90, right in town, uh, six lanes wide, I think, if I remember correctly, and it actually is nearly a, a 90 degree turn right on the interstate, and so there's one. I think the one in Binghamton has a name. Uh, I've heard Dead Men's Curve there on 81 online. I hadn't heard this one before. It's called Kamikaze Curve. Kamika all right, Kamikaze Curve. That must be, yeah, we've got, we've got some locals, all right. Anyways. And, uh, and if you get really serious about it, you, you know, there's signs that would indicate, you know, there's one thing if there's a little curve, and then there's quite a sharp curve. And then if you've been traveling, usually like in mountain roads, you have the one where the sign goes like that. <laughs> and so, you know, we can call them hairpin curves in the mountains. Um, and I remember uh, traveling in Israel, and, and Gail's going to be, I don't know if you'll be on these roads, but there are a few places uh, where you're going in November, you said, right? Yeah, so she'll be over in Israel in November. Um, there are some places in the mountains. I think the one I'm thinking of is up in Galley, uh, Golan Heights area, uh, where there are a series of hairpin turns. Maybe you remember this too, Rich. I don't remember. But actually, the roads are so uh, curvy there, by the way. The, you know, they do a lot of uh, tourism. And the buses actually, they intentionally narrow the wheelbases so that they can make sharper turns. And on one of those, I remember going and you're looking out the passenger, you know, normally you look through the front window to see the road. <laughs> but in this, on several of these turns, you're looking out the side window and you're like, we're going down there in a minute. The, road, the road's going down there. And what we have in this text is actually a road sign, a, a uh, warning sign that something challenging is coming. Uh, and so there's a message, there's instruction from our Savior to the disciples, and hence to us, by extension, uh, that comes with a warning sign. There's a sharp curve ahead in this text. Not, not a curve as in you won't get this, you don't understand, it's not hard to understand, but it is hard to do. And you'll see the disciples' reaction to that. And in fact, the text, in just a moment, we'll, we'll jump in here, the text will bring us to a second curve. We go from a sharp curve to a hairpin curve uh, in the text. So let's develop that. We want to be challenged by the text here and um, understand that uh, what it's leading to is forgiveness. Uh, we need to practice forgiveness. And you'll see the disciples raise questions. That, what about this? What about that? You know, and God says, Jesus says, 
Uh, no, you need to forgive one another. And so let's jump in here. The warning sign is found in verse 3. There's a warning sign uh, t- uh, to indicate a challenging command in verse 3. And the text says, uh, pay attention to yourselves. King, the King James, take heed to yourselves. That, there's the warning sign. Most of the time, uh, n- not, it, is, it is infrequent when Jesus would preface his instructions with, watch out. Uh, and and the, this is a warning. That I'm, I'm going to teach you something that you will balk at. I'm going to instruct you on something that you're, con- you're going to consider uh, dangerous travel. It's going to be hard to do. And so it opens there in verse 3, pay attention to yourselves, be on guard, watch out. And here is the command in, in verse 3, the command, and it fits into our series, that's why we're in this text. The challenging command, part 1 is, found in verse 3, and let me read it for you here. Uh, if, uh, pay attention to yourselves, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. Alright, so that's the first part of this uh, curve. That's the first part of this warning sign, the instructions, the command that he is giving. And the, uh, this is laid out in the sense of this is, uh, it's not just informational, this is command. Jesus is telling his disciples, this is what you are to do. That's through the whole text here. But it's actually in an imperative form, a command form. Here's what you do. If your brother sins, and, it, and, and it's, that's worded in such a way, uh, indicates that's very possible. And we know that, because we know our brothers, and they tend to sin, don't they? <laughs> By the way, they know us, and they know that we tend to stumble and sin too. And so if your brother sins, if there's a problem, if uh, offenses arise, if uh, problems occur, if, a, if your brother sins, first part of the challenge and command is rebuke him. Rebuke him. I won't do an official or an unofficial survey by show of hands this morning, but how many of you just enjoy going and confronting people? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a pastor and I, I don't like it either. <laughs> it's not fun to confront people. And for, I'm using that as a broad word because there, there are confrontations and there are confrontations, right? There are confrontations as in you have a chat with somebody and there are confrontations where you go up and yell at them. That's actually not what's happening here. But it does say rebuke him. If your brother sins against you, if there's a sin issue, you need to find out what's going on. The word here is rebuke. This is a particular form of the word rebuke that is a little bit more gentle. There's another word that's more, uh, more strongly worded. But this word indicates a confrontation in the broad sense of we need to talk, what's going on, uh, you know, th- this is what I saw, here's what's happening. And so there is a rebuke. That's the first part of this that's challenging is when we see trouble in somebody's life, when they have sinned against us, we are supposed to go to them and say, hey, what's going on? This is what happened. This is what I know. This is what I perceived. Uh, We need to talk this over and get this straightened out. And that's hard, isn't it? Most of us, again, I won't ask you to raise hands because I'd probably have to put mine up. You know, how many of you would rather ignore a problem? (laughs) A lot of us would rather do that. Just let it go, you know. But that is not the command. That's what I mean by a warning sign. The warning sign is, guess what? First command, if your brother sins, you need to deal with it. And the word here is rebuke. And this one, this one, this passage is given to the disciples. It's given to the one against whom the sin has been committed. And it is their responsibility, meaning it is yours and mine, when we are offended, when we are sinned against, it is our responsibility to go to the other person and rebuke them, to deal with it, to to begin the process of getting things right. And you might say, well, Pastor, I mean, that's not fair. If the the idiot brother, uh, if he sinned against me, why can't he come to me? Well, that's other passages. That's like Matthew 6. You know, if you're at the altar and you realize you've offended someone, you have something against the brother, leave your gift at the altar and you go take care of it. That's a different passage. That's not this passage. This passage is, if a brother sins against you, you go and deal with it. You go and talk to him. You rebuke him. The next step of this first command is, if your brother sins, rebuke him. Uh, you know, ask questions, find out what's going on, but rebuke him. And if he repents, if he acknowledges, if he, he, he's ready to get this ready, what do you do? Well, this is our whole series, isn't it? Forgive. 
you say, okay, I forgive. Uh, and all the things that go with it, we'll, we'll review that in a moment, but all the things that go with forgive, to, to cancel the debt, to, to let go of the obligation and restore, work towards restoration. If he repents, uh, then you forgive. That's, that's the first level of warning. That's the first road sign. Hey, there's a challenge here. This is hard. And the reason it's hard, because if it's just a small thing, you know, whatever a small thing is, most of us just deal with it. It might even be a thing where it falls under. We didn't even cover this passage, but where love covers a multitude of sins. It's something small, and, and you just, love covers it. I don't need, we don't even deal with it. But Jesus is dealing with something here where apparently, because he says, watch yourselves, be on guard, watch out. If your brother sins, you go rebuke him, and if he, if he repents, you forgive him. And I'm going to guess that pretty much everybody here, in fact, I would be surprised if it wasn't everyone here, has had something where the hurt that came from being sinned against was large enough deep enough into our lives and our hearts and our feelings that we gave a second thought, well, maybe I won't forgive. And that's why this is challenging. This is the first road sign. Hey, there's a curve ahead. Slow down. Watch out. If he repents, your instruction, your command from the Lord is forgive him. And so, you know, that idea, and I want to review here for just a minute this forgiveness. What do we mean by forgive? Well, this is what the series has been about. The, the series of, of forgiveness, we've learned some basic lessons. The whole series has been just the beginning. The whole series has been just uh, basic building blocks or find foundational facts about forgiveness. And, and four or five of them very quickly by way of review. So just thinking back over the last several weeks. One, is we started with the fact that God, it starts with God. He is absolutely holy and we're not. We're sinners, all of us. And so the, the, the standard is God's sinless perfection, his holiness, and we are sinning sinners. And our sins, here's what, where forgiveness is going to begin to be needed. When we sin, we incur an unpayable debt. We cannot get it right. That's beyond our capacity. We have an obligation. We have a debt. We have uh, something we owe to God beyond our ability to pay. And that's where forgiveness is a necessity. Forgiveness is God's uh, uh, process, God's planned operation by which uh, a, a sinner can be taken care of. He can be forgiven. He can be pardoned. And so we talked about that. Forgiveness is when God meets that obligation. Because he's holy, because his law is perfect and righteous, when we sin, we have a legal obligation. We have a sin debt. And um, God, even though he is merciful and loving, his holiness does not allow him to just look the other way. He can't just sweep it under the carpet. Uh, he can't just uh, let bygones be bygones. His holy law demands an accounting. And so forgiveness is God meeting that obligation. How did he do it? Uh, not by looking the other way, not just forgetting about it, but he paid the price. How? When? Where? Well, he paid the price in the form of the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That was the message, by the way. He said, Calvary covers it all. That, that's the basis of the forgiveness. The debt was paid uh, in, the, in the person of Christ and particularly in his shed blood. The shed blood is the legal basis, uh, the lawful justification for forgiveness to take place. It is on that basis that somebody paid the debt, and the debt was paid by Jesus Christ. All of us who are here today, uh, this payment was made for us. All of us who are here today who ex have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior uh, have experienced that, that forgiveness of sins. Uh, and it was, it was, the payment was made by Christ on the cross via his shed blood. And it was made ours when, at some point, if you're here today and you have trusted Christ as Savior, your own personal Savior by faith, uh, that payment was applied to your account at that point. For me, that was, you know, quite a while ago now, but uh, a little before I was five years old, uh, grew up in a Christian home. You've heard my testimony, but grew up in a Christian home. 
Uh, parents knew the Lord personally. It wasn't just they were religious, but they knew God personally. And, and that was part of, that was the part of our life, that go to church and talk about God and live it out in life. And so from the youngest age, before I can actually consciously remember, uh, we were taken to church. We heard the stories of Jesus. We heard the, the bad news of being sinners and the good news of Jesus Christ being the Savior. And so for me, at a pretty early age, a little before I was five years old, uh, one night my mom, the Lord got a hold of my heart, and through my mom's uh, testimony and witness, I came to trust in Christ. God opened my eyes. And it was at that time, I didn't understand all of it. I, didn't, you know, I hadn't read the whole Bible at that point. Uh, but I, I understood I was a sinner, and I needed forgiveness. And it was at that point that I experienced the forgiveness of God because of Jesus' shed blood. And so we, we call that being born again. We call that being justified. Paul, Paul kind of favors that term. Um, we, we call it the new birth. But it is being born again uh, into the family of God. And that's when that payment was made and applied to me. I trust you have a testimony, something like that. Your dates might be different. Uh, the, the particular circumstances may be different. But there's only one way to come to God. And that's through Jesus Christ and his shed blood. In any event, when God forgives us, this forgiveness, there's another part of this quick review, which is the part I'm describing right now is the legal forgiveness. That is in God's courtroom. Uh, God as the righteous judge of all the earth. And when someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ and, and receives by faith the shed blood of Christ on their behalf, they are saved, they are born again, they're justified, they are forgiven by God once for all, permanently. Sometimes we call that eternal security. Uh, sometimes we call it once saved, always saved. Um, I, I quite often just like to call it eternal life. We, you know, if, we, if we're born again, we have eternal life, and that means it's eternal. And by the way, sometimes questions come up, but we make the statement, once we're saved, we are always saved and we are always forgiven in that legal sense. That will never change. Uh, God doesn't change the rules midstream. God doesn't uh, change the game. He doesn't change the standards. When he declares that you or I, having trusted Christ as Savior, are forgiven and justified in his sight, that is it for all of eternity. And uh, I mentioned to a couple of the kids, I, would, I was trying to work in a illustrate. I use the kids once in a while. But a, a, a couple of the kids who will remain nameless at this point were playing a game recently out in the backyard. And uh, as the game went along, I was kind of listening and watching them and stuff. And the rules kept changing. Uh, one, one of them in particular kept changing the rules. You know, like, uh, you know, we, we even have an expression, you know, moving the goalpost, that kind of thing. But they were changing the rules. And I was mostly just listening and chuckling. But anyways, God isn't like that. He has a holy standard. It is, it is based upon his, his unchanging holy nature. And when he says, I declare you justified, I declare you righteous in my sight, forgiven because of Jesus' blood, that will never change. Uh, that is permanent. God doesn't change his mind, doesn't go back on his word. There's a second aspect of this, uh, not just the legal side in God's courtroom, but quite a bit of the time, the last few weeks that we've been talking about forgiveness, is the family side, the fellowship side. And I actually, in my mind, quite often in different passages, like to picture uh, God, as it were, uh, kind of anthropomorphism, a picture of God, humanly speaking, he is the righteous judge, but he, being my father, he comes into the house and he takes off the black judge's robe and he hangs it on the, the peg on the wall and he sets the gavel over there. He's, he's, he's not dealing with that at the moment. I've already been forgiven legally. I'm in his family. But he now has to deal with me as his child. And I stumble. I sin. I fail. And I need that cleansing forgiveness, that restorative forgiveness that fellowship forgiveness. And that is the one we're dealing with here more, is that is extended, and not just between us and God daily in a fellowship sense, but between brothers and sisters. And if it helps you to think of that, fellowship or family, it's actually like being around the table. 
I, again, I won't ask for a show of hands, but it, it, this would be true of most families. Have you ever uh, have you ever had a day where things didn't go well and and the family is not getting along, and then you sit down for dinner and it's it's a lot quieter dinner than normal uh, because nobody's ready to talk. But when forgiveness has been extended and when the fellowship is close, what's dinner like? Well, I hope you've experienced this in your family. Dinner is fun. Uh, the food's good too, but the, the being together as a family. By the way, that's when we have communion. That is table fellowship. When, well, that's, we want to be close to God. Forgiven uh, with God on a daily basis, this fellowship, restorative forgiveness. And so that's what we've looked at. The legal justification or the legal uh, forgiveness and the family forgiveness. But we want to get back into the text uh, because all those are just basically uh, uh, basics of forgiveness. We haven't dealt with complicating factors, consequences. There are those. We'll have to deal with that another time. But these basic principles are going to be true even when life is complicated. The, the principles of forgiveness are the same. And so we, we'll, we'll deal with those at some other time. Back in Luke 17, we're still in this warning. Watch out for yourselves. If your brother sins, go to him, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. That's hard enough. But we now see the road sign, the warning sign, was actually one step harder. In fact, quite a bit harder. So picture in your mind a situation that you have faced, or at least hypothetically, a friend, a loved one, a brother, a sister, somebody in this church has offended you kind of bad. And it's hard. You go to them, you deal with it, and, and God gives grace. And they say, I, I'm sorry, I confess it. And you say, I forgive you. Well, that, that's hard enough. We've all probably been there at some point. But look at verse number 4 in light of that. The warning sign, watch out. Verse 4 goes on. And if he sins against you, what? Seven times. And some of you probably say, you know, Pastor, you don't know my brother. <laughs> Seven's on the low side. <laughs> but this is, this is uh, seven times in the day. It's like, this is a daily occurrence, seven times per day. Uh, and, and just a side note, I'm not sure, se I don't think you're going to keep a clicker, and when you hit eight, you know, we're done. It, the seven is probably indicative of this just keeps going. But anyways, here it is. If he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, what do you do with seven of them? You must forgive him. Well, you talk about a, a curve in the road. Talk about a hairpin curve. This is going to be tough, isn't it? Uh, one time is hard enough. Once in a while. Uh, we've been offended. We've been hurt. Our feelings have been stomped on. Uh, it, it's been distressful. They've, they've hurt us. They've wronged us. And Jesus says, well, if he, if he repents, forgive him. Uh, okay, I, I guess I can do that. And then he says, and if he does it seven times in a day... And he comes back to and says, I repent, you keep forgiving. You can see where this is going to be hard, isn't it? The, what the, the general thing is, the, the principle is, the forgiveness keeps on going. By the way, is that not how God deals with us in Christ? I will not ask again for a show of hands if, if any of you have sinned more than seven times in one day. <laughs> I would suspect that we should all put our hands up. You know, we've all stumbled uh, in many ways. And, and we come to the Lord, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. I need your cleansing. And God just keeps on doing it. That's 1 John 1.9 we looked at. But here's where we go with this. The warning sign, the, the hardness. If, if your brother sins, repents, you go to him and he repents, forgive him. If he keeps on doing it and he says, I repent, you keep on forgiving. And I want to show you from this, there are three, three uh, reactions from the disciples, three kind of uh, road hazards, three, three excuses they try to make that are here in the text. And Jesus is going to nip them in the bud. He's going to say, none of these make any difference. That's what makes this a hard passage. Excuse number one is found in the next couple of verses, five and six. Uh, verses five and six. And it event, it event, he, uh, essentially says... The disciples, their reaction to this instruction, forgive and keep on forgiving no matter what. Their reaction is what? This is, if you read between the lines, it is in verses 5 and 6, this is really hard, this is impossible. 
This is, using our analogy today, this is an impassable road. We can't travel this road. And the way they worded it is, Lord, increase our faith. And so basically what they're saying is, we probably could do this, maybe we could do this uh, when we have more faith. Let me read verses 5 and 6 for you. The apostles, in reaction to this statement, keep on forgiving, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Sounds pretty pious, doesn't it? Sounds like... Like, we all would like our faith increased. We increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. What's going on here? Well, their excuse, the, the way they're trying to wiggle out of the, they they understand this is a hard thing to do. That's why the warning, watch yourselves. And their first reaction is, uh, increase our faith. If we only had more faith, maybe we could do this. And Jesus' answer is, this has nothing to do with faith. <laughs> if you had faith as small as a, as a mustard seed, and mustard seeds are, uh, as I understand it, at least in that day of Jesus, the smallest seeds in, in the Near East. They're, they're almost like a powder. They're just extremely small. The, the point being, the point being you, you don't need faith to do this. This is not a matter of faith. This is a matter of obedience. This is my command. You will do it. You don't have to believe. And I'm not saying faith isn't part of Christian living, but the answer here is it's not a matter of increasing your faith. It's a matter of doing it. And so they're challenged there. Number two, I actually back you up to verse four. The excuse that's implicit, but he, he's already dealt with it, is I'll, I'll do this when I see the fruit of the repentance. And so a longer discussion, I mean, to suggest repentance should normally uh, bring forth fruit. If you remember in Matthew 3, when John preached uh, a baptism of repentance, when he said the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent, and, and so on. And he said a few verses later in Matthew 3, um, bring forth fruits, meet, or in, in fitness with repentance. Repentance ought to uh, offer forth, ought to bring forth fruit. But the text says this in verse 4, If he sins against you seven times in a day, and turns to you seven times, and here, I notice the word saying. He, he says he repents. He says, I repent, you must forgive him. And the second excuse that might come up is, I will repent when I see the changes in his life. Again, we, as a broader picture in Christian growth, when someone is growing in Christ, when they're repenting from different things, we do expect to see changes. We do expect to see fruit. We do expect to see uh, good results. But think about the literal wording of this. If somebody sins seven times in one day, and they come back to you seven times and say, I repent, we, we might even throw there again, uh, I, I'm telling you I repent, and then they do it again, and they come to you and say, I repent. And they do it again, and come to you and say, I repent. And they do it again. Uh, there is not really practically time to see the results and the fruit in their lives. Is there? In one day to see a change. And uh, it, th this is all based on they have come back and they've indicated by verbal assent, I repent. And so when we, when, if we make the excuse, when I see fruit, I, you know, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, they really offended me, they hurt me. They're struggling. They're, something's wrong. They told me they repented. I'll forgive them maybe next year when I see that they've made changes. That is out the window as well. He says that they come seven times in a day saying, I repent. You must forgive them. The third excuse is found in verses 7 through 9. 7 through 9, which read this way. Will any of you who, is, who has a servant, who has a slave who is plowing or keeping sheep, say to him when he has come in from the field, uh, come at once and recline at table. All right, so picture this. You, you're, you're a homeowner, you're a estate manager, you, you own some property, and you have some servants, you have slaves. And uh, one of them has been out in the field uh, plowing, and it's a hot day, you know, the Near East, it gets pretty warm. He's out plowing, he's been working all day. He comes in, he is grimy and sweaty and smelly, and he looks exhausted, he's, and, but he's your servant. How many of you are going to say, look, look, slave, uh, you look exhausted. Yeah, you know, you go eat first. <laughs> the, 
That's not how it works. It's verse 8. Will you not, will he, the owner, not rather say to him, you prepare supper for me, get dressed properly, and serve me while I eat and drink. And afterward, you can eat and drink. Does he, think the, does he thank the servant, rather, because he did what he was commanded? In other words, this is an issue of obedient servanthood, this issue of forgiveness. And in this little parable, this little story, just a couple verses, uh, an estate manager, an owner, has a slave who's been out working in the field. He is hot, sweaty, grimy. The slave comes in. The owner does not say, you look tired, you know, you, you go eat first. He says, get washed up, fix my meal, and serve me. That's your job. And he's not going to even necessarily thank him for it because it's his job. And so the challenge here, the, the wording we would put, if it was excuse one, when I get more faith, I'll forgive. Number two, when I see the fruit, I'll forgive. Here it's when I feel like it, I'll forgive. And we get into a little bit of a discussion here on this one, when I feel like it, when, you know, the slave uh, does not feel like serving his master, when he's exhausted, when, he is, uh, when he's been out in the hot sun all day, when he is hungry himself and has not eaten, it is still his job to serve his master, his Lord, first. And so he is going to do that even when he doesn't feel like it. And so we sometimes have discussions like this, actually from both sides of the forgiveness coin. Uh, you know, so-and-so offended me, uh, they, they sinned against me, they were in the wrong, uh, and they, they said, I repent, but I don't feel like forgiving them. I don't, I don't feel like granting forgiveness. I'm still really hurt. And in fact, you know, we take the discussion a step further. We might even say, um, since I don't feel like it, wouldn't it be hypocritical for me to say, I forgive you? Wouldn't that be kind of hypocritical? I don't really feel like forgiving them, but I'm going to tell them you're forgiven. And the answer, we need to review this for a minute. This is pretty significant, is forgiveness is not a feeling. One of the definitions that we worked on over these last few weeks is forgiveness. It's the canceling or the pardoning, canceling of a debt. But one of the definitions we used is uh, forgiveness is a promise. Forgiveness is a promise to, to release the person uh, from the obligation. And we're not dealing with consequences, but release the person from the obligation. And to not bring it up against them again. That's what God does when he forgives us. You remember... Uh, the text from the Old Testament, um, I, I've forgiven you and your sins I will remember no more. God makes that promise. That's an example. That's the epitome uh, of an illustration of forgiveness. And when you and I are dealing with each other and we say, I forgive you, our feelings as the forgiving agent, the one who is extending forgiveness, our feelings don't really matter. This is a matter of obedience to Christ's commands. And when we make that promise, uh, we can do that regardless of our feelings. We can say, I recognize this is the right thing to do. I forgive you and I will keep that promise. Um, and so that's, that's when I feel like forgiving is not a valid excuse. It's a misunderstanding of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is a transaction. Forgiveness is a promise and when God forgives us, he has forgiven us. Uh, that's the other side of the coin, by the way. Sometimes uh, we might not feel forgiven by God ourselves. We're struggling with something. And how can I keep doing this over? That's where I've tended to see it as repetitive things. Uh, how, how can God keep forgiving me? I don't feel forgiven. Must be I'm not. And I, I remind myself, I remind you, on, when we receive God's forgiveness, that also is not a feeling. It's not just an emotion. It is a transaction, or the word we're using here today is promise. God promises to not remember our sins any longer, not bring them up against us. And so these three excuses, when I get more faith, I can forgive. When I see the fruit in the other person's life and see the changes, uh, when I feel like it, um, not valid excuses. And, and uh, the, the point here is, it is a matter of obedience as a servant. Christ said forgive. Christ said seven times in a day if it happens and he says I repent you keep on forgiving.
And in fact, that leads us to the conclusion here that forgiveness is just the beginning. Notice in verse 10 to close off this morning. Having told this little story about the, the, the slave and the landowner. Verse 10, so you also, in the same way, I'm making a point out of this story, Jesus. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded. Well, what were they commanded? What was the command? Verses 3 and 4, forgive. When you have done all that you were commanded, here's what you can say. We are just unworthy. We're unprofitable servants. We have only done what is our duty. So when I say forgiveness is just the beginning, I mean it's just the starting point. It is just the duty of God's servants, of Christ's servants, to forgive one another. It's not, I, I know the challenge, I can see it in the text. That's why I call it a warning sign. It's hard to do sometimes. Uh, it's difficult to keep repeating someone, a repeat a problem, a repeat offense against us. We, we have trouble with that. But when we get done with this text, Jesus says, it's not really a matter of big faith. You don't have to have the faith of, of the greatest faith man in the world. You just need to obey. It's not a matter of seeing fruit in their lives today. It's a matter of forgiving today. It's not even a matter of uh, if you feel like it. Uh, you know, when you get around to it when, it, when it's convenient, when you think you make sense of the whole thing, you forgive. No, your duty is to forgive. It's just the beginning. Where we want to move past what, by beginning, I mean, there are things beyond that. To love one another. Uh, to to uh, share in the graces of Christ. To grow in, in, in uh, service together. That's, that's the beyond part. But when we do forgiveness, all we're doing is obeying. And I, I would challenge, I would call myself and each of you to understand that this is what we need in our lives towards one another. Uh, is this forgiveness. When we have done all we're commanded, which is forgive one another, we have just done our duty. It's just the beginning. May God help us to do that. Take your hymn books. We're going to close this morning with hymn 400.